Hey guys, thank you for joining me. As you know, I am Nefinity, an urban apologist. I answer questions dealing with being Christian and being Black and being woke from the African-American perspective. So today we are going to be talking about the cross and the unk. And some of you may know that I once was what you would now call a hotep or a member of the conscious community. I used to believe a lot of the things that I am now arguing against after having done research on their validity. And one of those arguments is that the cross was stolen from Egypt. It was stolen from the unk. I even have an unk tattoo and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. So let's go ahead and let the people speak for themselves as is my custom. I like to let them tell you what they believe and then we go ahead and show you how that's some nonsense. This is a prominent uh, comedic scholar by the name of Baba Haru, and he's going to break down for you the meaning of the Ankh. This is the, the um, preeminent sign of the African spiritual high culture because it honors, first of all, the mother, the womb. It honors the father and the synthesis, the children that comes from the womb through the seed of the father. It also symbolizes the water that rises up from the earth up to the clouds, falling back on the earth as rain to bring vegetation out of the ground. It also is spirit, mind, and matter. So however you look at Ankh, it shows the continue, uh, continuous regeneration of the life force. Now when the Romans um, adopted Christianity in order to co-opt it, they removed the sacred womb as the symbol. So we'll, we'll get into uh, some more of that, some of what he said in a moment, but let's hear what this sister has to say. That is what the Ankh is. The Ankh represents you. It represents life. It represents reincarnation. It represents everything but what Christianity represents, and that is death, okay? Death of the Christ, death of the Son of God, that is not what this represents, okay? This is an Ankh. This is positivity. This is divine love and light, okay? That cross was stolen. That is a stolen symbolism, all right? That is a stolen symbolism in order to brainwash people to think that this is not the correct way. She just said a whole lot of stuff. So we heard Baba Haru say that the unk represents the, the coming together of man and woman, that the top represents the womb, which means the bottom part represents the pee pee, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, then he also said it represents agriculture and evaporation, and she's saying it represents reincarnation. It just sounds like they just make up any explanation for what the unk is supposed to be. And I think also, why I bring up Christianity, like she just uh, it represents everything that Christianity does not rep everything Christianity does not represent Christianity apparently represents death that's what Christianity is about it's about death mm -hmm. but I also find that she that it's odd that she herself is engaging in appropriation of Hindu culture what is that palm doing behind you sis and the elephant and these elements of different cultures that are not African or Egyptian in origin but mm, that's a conversation for another day let's get into what the, um, that is actually symbolizes what does the unk symbolize the unk is a word it, it, it's a symbol meaning life so i'll get into some more about what symbolism how symbolism works toward the end of the presentation but here we find that it represents life you see that um deities often are offering it to the nostrils of um different egyptian characters um kings pharaohs um and even lay people uh, here we see that the sun is giving life in the form of the unk to the people of Kemet and that they're grateful for it because, you know, life comes from the light of the sun, right? And sun worship or whatever. But it represents life. That's what the unk represents. Now, we heard them say that it represents different things. So I decided, let me look into this. Can I find this substantiated anywhere in Egypt? And oh, the irony. So I'm just take this little moment to say that anytime somebody tells you that something means something or that Christianity stole something from Egypt, or, you know, any such claim, the answer to that claim is show me, show me in the original text. 
You will not find anywhere in the Egyptian original text uh, that it says that the unk is uh, uh, the genitalia or whatever the case is. But we'll get into who actually did come up with this. And here it is. So I want to draw your attention to the between these two arrows here. It says the origin of the unk is contested, meaning don't nobody really know where it came from. Um, but we do know that it means life. Now, the extent of that and you know, the visual representation of it being different things is what we're about to discuss. So we, it says here, the Victorian, which you can read European, Egyptologist Thomas Inman suggested that the unk began as a representation of the female squeeze box and the male dangly bits. Though being a Victorian, Inman phrased this with infinitely more elegance and style. So obviously this is not a scholarly work because he's talking about squeeze boxes and dangly bits. So let's go back to Inman himself. This is a, a figure, a box, uh, a table from Inman's book. And you'll see different variations of a cross here. I want to draw your attention specifically to number nine, which is at the bottom left corner. That is the unk. And then the huge one in the center is number four. And the reason why that's important is because his work entitled Ancient Pagan and Modern Christian Symbolism, notice that Thomas Inman's name ends in MD. He's a medical doctor. He is not an, an Egyptologist by trade. He did not study Egyptology. He was an amateur Egyptologist. So these are his gatherings. These are his thoughts. So remember I said, remember figure four, that's figure four in the middle. It says figure four is copied in conventional form from plate uh, 35 um, of, of two essays on the worship of Priapus. The object was found at St. Agati. It is a cruce ansata, which we'll get into a bit later. And what is the cruce ansata formed by, according to him, for thali with a female, with a circle of female organs around the center. So for those of you who don't know, a phallus, phalli is the plural of phallus, and a phallus is a male PB. So he's saying that this uh, icon, icon here is a male PB surrounded by female genitalia. They have an obsession with sex organs, okay? Then we see figure nine here at the bottom. Figure nine is a well-known Egyptian symbol born in the hand of almost every divinity. It is a cross with one limb made to represent the female element in creation. The name that it technically bears is Crux Ansata, or the cross with a handle. And it says the same thing here in the middle, but it just has the unk there to show you that he's referring to the unk. Figure nine, once again, is the unk on the bottom left corner. You see the number nine written on it. That's in that book. Now, he mentioned the worship of Priapus, a book entitled The Worship of Priapus. Here is the two essays on the worship of Priapus. Uh, warning, this video is rated uh, PG-13, Okay. Yes, these people have an obsession with, and we're talking about Greeks and Romans and ancient uh, European thought as it relates to the worship of reproductive organs. So that is a giant peepee -pee there, yes. And so they're saying that the unk is a peepee. -pee. It's a peepee -pee and a womb put together, much like the cross, right? <laughs> we can tell we stole that from there. So there are very many variations of the cross. We have the Greek cross. We have the papal cross, the patriarchal cross. We have so many different crosses. This, isn't, this is just a sample. There's at least mm, probably about a dozen or so variations of the cross. But let's talk about the cross. We talked about the unk. Now, to me, the argument that Christians stole the cross from the unk would make sense if, if it's a myth like these people try to say. If the crucifixion of Christ is a myth, then that would make sense that we stole the cross. We had to get it from somewhere. But the reality of the matter is Romans actually crucified people on crosses. This is a historical reality that they put two beams together and stuck nails through them and killed people on them. And so we have evidence here is a meme that I did a few years back on Facebook where it says, proof, the Romans engaged in crucifixion, a nail attached to the heel bone of a Jewish man, Yekanan ben Hakol, discovered in 1968. And here I put this Israel Exploration Journal because the people who came to the conclusion that this was a Jew were Jews, not Christians. These are Jews that are saying, yes, the Romans crucified people. If anything, Jews who have not accepted Christ as the Messiah would want to, let's say, try to make a distinction or a separation between history and the fact that there were actually crucifixions because they don't want to give validation to the fact that Christ was crucified. But nevertheless, here we have 
historical data. And this is the title of the article, which I'm going to put the link to. It's on JSTOR. You can read how they came to the determination that this was from crucifixion and um, that the Romans actually crucified Jews. Here we have a, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus who says, how justly this judgment came upon the Jews. This is someone else. He's quoting someone else that said that the Jews were justified in that the judgment was justified upon the Jews. It says that Romans wanted room for the crosses and crosses for the bodies of these Jews. They wanted to crucify Jews. And it says that they had brought this judgment on themselves by the crucif crucifixion of their Messiah. This is Roman thought that the Jews justified their own judgment of crucifixion because they crucified their Messiah. This is a Jewish scholar saying this way, way back in the day. Now, also, we have in the Third Servile War a slave rebellion under Spartacus, and the Roman general Crassus orders Spartacus's followers six thousand of them to be crucified along the road from Capua to Rome. Actual crucifixion, 6,000 bodies. So it's not just Roman crucifixion, not just Roman crucifixion of Jews, but it's Roman crucifixion of people that they deemed criminals, their own people, their own Roman people. This is a rebellion of Romans. And so the rebels were crucified. So again, if Christianity had stolen the cross from the Unk, there, we should expect that there would be no evidence that the Romans actually crucified people, which is what we claim we got the cross from. Christians claim, no, we didn't get it from the unk. We got it from the actual crucifixion of Christ. And here we have evidence that the Romans indeed crucified people. Now, let me give you some more history about the shape of the cross, because you have Jehovah's Witnesses and others who say, well, Jesus wasn't even crucified on no cross. It was crucified on a beam, a stake. It was simply one stick going upright. So let's talk about some ancient church fathers who also countered the argument that the Christian cross wasn't something that Christians adapted until the fourth century, which would have been the 300s. Uh, the, right? Fourth century? 300s? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, second century is one. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. My mind brain fart. Anyway, um, we have Christian historians or Christian uh, church fathers talking about the cross. And here it says Tertullian in 197 AD says that the very structure of the human body is the essential and primal outline of a cross. So he's talking about the spine and then the shoulders forming the shape of a cross. The shoulders traverse the spine. If you position the man with his, man, with his arms outstretched, you shall have created the image of a cross. These are Tertullian's words, and I give you the reference so you can look it up for yourself a little later. Another word about Tertullian that you may not know, he was an African. He was born in Africa, and he served as an early African church father. You may know him for having coined the term New Testament. He also said that birds resemble Christians in prayer because at that time, Christians used to pray with their arms stretched out to symbolize Christ's death on the cross. More data. Tertullian also says in his book, De Corona, or his work, De Corona, chapter three, which was written in 204, that Christians make the sign of the cross on their foreheads before doing everything. When you read it, he says, before they take a bath, before they eat, before they leave their house, before they talk to their friends, before, he's, it's an exaggeration, but he says that they perform the cross, the sign of the cross on their foreheads. This is in two, um, 204, prior to the fourth century. Origen, another African church father, also says that um, the mark Ezekiel put on the foreheads of men in Ezekiel 9 verse 4 was the sign of the cross. Now, I'm not saying that it's a sign of the cross. I'm just showing you here that early church fathers understood that he was crucified on an actual cross, and they actually believe that this event took place. Here we have um, an ancient, well, it's called a graffiti, <laughs> um, basically symbol showing a, a Christian being crucified on the cross with a donkey head, which they say is kind of like they're mocking Christians because they didn't think very highly of us. Cle Clement of Alexandria, who lived 150, another church father, 150 to 215 AD, says that the shape of the cross is that of a T, a, a towel, the Greek letter towel, which is a T. Now, here is a symbol that combines the towel with another Greek letter, the rho. So this starogram is also called a towel rho. It's a monogram. It is the imposition of two letters, the two letters, one over the other, and it symbolizes Jesus. 
obviously Jesus dying on the cross. Two different Greek letters put together make this symbol. It actually appears in some of the surviving Christian manuscripts, such as the Gospel of John. They put this here in their um, in the text to, to summarize the death of Christ and his sacrifice for us as Christians or for humanity, really. Um, okay, so we have this symbol that looks like an unk, but it ain't an unk. It's two different letters put together, two different Greek letters to represent Christ's death on the cross. But we do have iconography that is far more similar to an unk in um, Egypt and in Ethiopia. And this is the Crux Ansada that we've been hearing them talk about. The Crux Ansada is not actually an unk. It's different from the unk in the respect that it has a circular top rather than the teardrop shape. Let me show you an unk again. Rather than the teardrop shape of the unk, it has a circle. So this is one way we distinguish it, but it was adapted by Christians in the fourth and fifth century. The earliest usage that we find, this is an uh, Egyptian copy of the New Testament. Uh, again, this is fourth or fifth century. This down here at the bottom, also fourth or fifth century. And we even see different variations of the cross inside of it, which means that the adaptation or the acceptance of this symbol, the Crux Ansada, or a cross with a handle, is known by them at the same time that they already were using the cross as a symbol, because here the two are combined. The two are combined now to me it's kind of like the argument well you know uh if 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 humans come from monkeys why do we still have monkeys right if if the cross came from the unk why would they continue to be why would they um why would they continue to be using the unk if it's a perversion of the unk they wouldn't continue to be using this symbol they would be using exclusively the cross now interestingly enough the use of the unk or the cross um, uh, Ansata, the, cru the crooks Ansata, is actually continued only in this region. So these are people who grew up knowing the Coptic language, because this is a Coptic cross. Coptic, for those of you who don't know, is uh, indigenous Egyptian. So when you hear Coptic, you can think Black Egyptians, the people who were originally there. The language that they spoke is Coptic, and they continue to use very a lot of the words that are found, very many of the words that are found on the uh, the hieroglyphs or the metonetter. Uh, so this is a word meaning life. Once again, it's a word that means life and they adapted it. But when Christianity adapts this symbol or a symbol that looks similar to an Ankh, it is in that region where the Ankh was already a part of their everyday language. And it only stayed over there. You don't see the crooks Ansata in Roman um, or other places in Western Christianity. You don't see it in the United States. You don't see it in other places. It is limited in its use to that geographic location because it was already a part of their culture and they use both of them side by side. Once again, down here you see variations of the cross with the Crux Ansata, which arguably is the strongest argument for an unk. Now, it's a symbol, it's a word that means life. A lot of times Christians get up in arms and they're like, oh, it's a pagan symbol. You know, you're not gonna see me walk around with a swastika even though it's just a symbol. But my point is, it's a word. And you can't demonize every word. You can't demonize every symbol. It's just, it's just a word. Um, I want to prove that to you by showing you some psychologists, um, PhDs, who discuss what symbols are. Here in the bolded portion, it says, such symbols are usually words, which are themselves collections of symbols called alphabets, standing for direct or indirect impressions. Down at the bottom, we have another one that says, a symbol, be it a gesture, map, or word, represents the information about the world, and it appears to tap into a common mechanism. So basically, all, all words, all words are symbols. All of these letters that you're looking at up here, they're symbols. You have come to identify them as letters, but these are just, you know, drawings. They're just scratchings. And we have given them meaning. Human beings have given them meaning so that we can have a uniform way of communicating with each other. You can use these same letters, these same symbols for different languages. The Spanish language is used with these same symbols. Um, French. Latin, Portuguese, the same letters are used to identify um, to identify this to identify the language, the, the ideas. So basically, we give the uh, we give the meaning to the symbols. So when I say that the unk is a symbol, it's a word. It's a word that means life. 
It is an actual, in their language, a word. I'm, I'm trying to help you understand that even though they use pictographs, it's still a word. Okay, it's still a word. So let's summarize the argument. The unk is a comedic symbol of life said to represent male and female genitalia or peepees. Uh, the question is, did Christianity steal the cross from the young? The answer is no. And how do we support this? With historical evidence that the Romans actually engaged in crucifixions. Christ Christians say that we got the cross because Christ was killed on it. They didn't convert or revert or pervert the unk into a cross. No, there was a cross. There was a system of crucifixion, a cross on which Christ died. And this is how we came to adopt this symbol. The earliest usage of the cross as a symbol by Christians is in the second century, whereas evidence of the Christians using the crux ansada in the regions such as Ethiopia and Egypt is at earliest fourth or fifth century, which means the cross was already being used by Christians before those Christians adapted the unk, which is a word in their common language. They also make this argument that the unk represents life and, and the cross represents death, but no Christian I know looks at this symbol and thinks death. We look at the symbol and we think eternal life because of the sacrifice that God made for us to be able to inherit eternal life. So which, you know, which is the truth. The truth of the matter is the cross does not represent death, but even if it did, you, we all know that Christ resurrected three days later, and this is a historical person who actually existed, and we can get into evidence of uh, Christ's actual existence in another discussion. If you learned anything from this video, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, share the video with somebody who may think that everything about Christianity was ripped off from somewhere else. These are discussions that we have and topics that I go further into in my course, Intro to Urban Apologetics, which can be found at courses.nefernity.com. You can purchase the course at, at one whole price, or you can enter a monthly subscription for just $10. And we talk about early African Christianity. We talk about Christianity and Kemet. We talk about the Bible and slavery, which are all important subjects to the Black Christian. We also talk about whether African Americans are the true Israelites. We're going to get into that. And some biblical archaeology as well. If you cannot afford the $10 a month, I also offer free resources for you to dive deeper into your studies as a Black Christian on my website, nefernity.com backslash resources. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to inbox me. And let's talk about how it doesn't make sense for them to claim that the cross was stolen from the young when the Romans actually killed people on crosses. Stay Christian, stay Black, stay woke, stay tuned.